Hello, and welcome to another episode of Making Sense of Social Media, the podcast that is intended for small business owners to learn more and dig deeper into content marketing for their businesses. My name is Lori Clausen, and I'm really excited to bring to you a guest today that has so much experience when it comes to content. Her name is Dana Hara, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. She's going to be bringing so much value. Enjoy. So welcome, Dana. I'm so excited to have you here. Go ahead and introduce yourself to those watching and listening today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Lori. So I'm Dana Hara. I am a content marketing strategist and brand voice expert. Uh, My focus is on helping businesses build sustainable content marketing plans. So getting the maximum value for the minimum amount of effort and not turning yourself into a full-time content machine. That word sustainable in and of itself is such a key factor because we we get so many mixed messages from all over the internet as to what to do and what not to do. So having people like you in their life is wonderful. So I'm excited to dive into some of the topics today around content marketing. Great. So let's just dive right in. What are the main goals of creating and distributing content on social media platforms? So there are several goals. And one of the first places where people start straying and getting themselves overwhelmed and not sustainable is in trying to do all of them. You don't have to pursue all of them. Uh, You need to pick the goals that are important for your business at this particular moment in time. So one is brand building. That's raising awareness, letting people know who you are, what you do, how you do it, why they should care. Uh, Just introducing yourself to your audience and sort of finding your people. Then another goal might be lead gen or -hmm. demand gen, you know, educating people about why they need the thing that you have. There is an element of bottom of funnel, um, actually getting the conversions. I would not stress that very hard as an early goal for most businesses. Like if you need conversions right away, if you you are on a time crunch, um, content is not a fast route. It's an effective one. And the returns compound over time, which is the great thing about it. Uh, But if you need conversions like tomorrow, then you're going to want to look at an ad campaign, not at a content campaign. So there is a bottom of funnel component to content, um, but really it's more about taking people on that journey when they're not ready to buy yet so that when they are ready to buy, you're the one that they want to buy from. So would you say this is applicable to any kind of business model? I'm thinking like your local dog walker all the way through to like maybe a super popular coffee shop in your town or, you know, something even larger than that? Is this, is this applicable to any type of business model? It absolutely can be because content is such a broad term um, and social media is such a broad term. Mm -hmm. So again, it's about picking the right goals for that. Um, If you are, you know, a local dog walking business, you're not trying to hit tens of thousands of people everywhere, right? You need people in your neighborhood. Same for like your local coffee shop. If you run an online business, then you have a much bigger pool. You actually might have, you actually might not be trying to hit that many more people, but you're trying to hit people across a wider geographic area. Right. Uh, but everybody can use content. And that's, you know, that's been demonstrated by, the small coffee shops and people who are only really marketing to a local audience that managed to go viral just because their content is so good. I love that content is, is it can be free. It can be extremely impactful, but my goal with this podcast and interviewing wonderful people like you is to make it really step-by-step clear on what any type of business owner can do with content. So I just, I so appreciate you putting like those different puzzle pieces in place. It really does going to start with what are you trying to do and Uh who are you trying to talk to? 
Yeah. You need to have those two pieces in place before you do anything, before you do any kind of marketing. What's the end goal you're trying to reach? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I mean, if you think of marketing like a journey, right? If your destination is two blocks away, you don't need to take a plane. If your destination is an ocean away, you need a plane or a boat, right? Like your, your route is going to change depending on the destination you have in mind. Oh, I love it. Love it. How do you measure the effectiveness and impact of your social media content? And then further to that, do you have some key metrics and or tools that you use to determine effectiveness? That's so important. Um, one of the big complaints people will have about content is that it's it can be hard to measure, and it can be, partly because it's a long game and partly because if you're not looking for uh, conversions, you know, sales are easy to measure. It's easy to count sales. It's harder to count and measure things like brand impact and awareness. That said, before you start any kind of marketing activity, you should have some kind of metrics in mind because otherwise, how are you going to know if it works or not? Right. You know, I, I, I've had I've had a lot of conversations that you know start with things with a statement like, "Content marketing doesn't work for me." And when you say, okay, well, let's get dive into that a little deeper. What were you expecting it to do that it didn't do? Mm -hmm. And people don't really have an answer for that. Or they say, well, I didn't get any new sales. Like, okay, well, again, if that was your goal, what what were you doing to get to that goal? Was did you choose the right path? You know, did you take a boat when you should have taken a plane? Right. Right. So metrics that you can measure really depend on the goal you're trying to reach. If your goal is lead gen, then inbound inquiries, right? If your goal is brand building and awareness raising, then it's the things that get branded as uh, vanity metrics. Engagement Mm -hmm. does matter. If that's what you're trying to do, if you're trying to get people to know your brand, then yeah, engagement matters. Follower counts matter. How often your post is shared matters. Mm -hmm. Um, you can track impact on your sales process by asking the people who land, who get into your sales funnel, where did you, where did you hear about us? It's so funny because that's such an old school thing to do, right? Like I used to (laughs) sell ads way back in the day and that was ask people, how did you find out about me? And if they say, I've been following you on LinkedIn or I saw a TikTok video. Okay, great. Chalk that one up. Um, as an impression, mm-hmm. that's, that's marketing is so tricky because in this era where we can measure and count, it feels like everything, you know, there's technology to measure and count everything, Yeah. but the buying journey doesn't happen like that because people's brains don't work like that. It yeah. is so rare. If you even apply it to your own life that you read a social media post and clicked over and bought something from that company and it can be directly attributed. Mm-hmm. What happens a lot more often is you read a social media post and maybe you subscribe to an email and you read the emails for a while and then you unsubscribe because you had too much email and then you saw an ad and you're like, oh yeah, I really liked those guys. And eventually something happens and you need that thing. And so you go to do research and when you Google it, that name pops up in your feed results and you're like, oh, right. I remember these guys. They know what they're talking about. I trust them. And so you click and you buy and on the attribution software, it says SEO. That's yeah. what that's what got us that sale. It was a Google search. I was like, but was it? <laughs> it's it's a whole ecosystem that you're creating, uh, and every piece should build up the poss- the probability that the other pieces will be successful. Oh my goodness! Okay, listeners, watchers, you just got a masterclass on the buyer's journey. <laughs> It's really true. Like, it's just, it's not a one-stop shop. It's, it's a system. Like you, you, like you said, it's an ecosystem. And we want it to be simple. I get it. We want it to be clear from from when we're on the seller end, we want it to be clear, but take yourself out of your seller shoes and put yourself into the buyer shoes. Think of how you buy stuff. It's not linear like that. You become aware of the companies that do a thing and you kind of develop 
some emotional balance of who you trust and who you don't. And you just carry that around with you for a while. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I suggest that to my, my coaching clients all the time too. And when they are unsure or unclear on what type of content to create, I always say, well, what type of content do you click on or do you stop to watch or do you mm-hmm. stop to read? Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's a really good indication of the type of content that you need to be making. So, yeah, yeah. it's a good place to start. Um, mm-hmm. And if it's not, not working for you, or if it's not delivering the kind of results you expect, it's also important though, to keep in mind that you are not your audience, that you are not your customer. Yeah. And almost always comes back to customer research and talking to people and finding out where are they hanging out. If I, I mean, I love LinkedIn. I do. And for me, it works because I sell to small businesses and medium-sized businesses who tend to be on LinkedIn. You know, I also love personally, I love going on threads. I love Instagram. I don't really use them because that's not where the people I'm selling to are buying things that I do. But you enjoy consuming. Right, yeah. exactly. Like I can, I might click on it and like, yeah, this is this is great, but I'm not <laughs> I'm not my customer. That's it's something yeah. difficult to kind of get over. Like we all want to create the things that we like. And that makes yeah. sense. But there's a sweet spot between what you like to make and what your customers like to consume. Right. It's the overlap. That's where you need to be focusing your efforts. Yeah. Otherwise you can spin your wheels for a long time. And after a while you don't like making the thing anymore. It's not fun anymore yeah. because it starts to feel like a drag. That's such a good point. And yeah, testing and tweaking, testing and tweaking. That's a huge part of, of marketing in general. So. What are some best practice tips um, for creating engaging and relevant content for your target audience? And I emphasize engaging because that's a, like you said earlier, engagement is, is it matters. So how do we create something they're going to, you know, comment on or share? So the, the short answer is I have a rule that I like to follow called the three E's and you need to aim for at least one of the three E's. Two is better, but at least one. People are going to engage with content if it is um, entertaining if it is educational Mm -hmm. or if it is my third E is a little bit fuzzy, but it's, I say enlightening. It makes you think about something differently than you thought about it before. Um, Right. And it's got, it's got to be at least one of those two is better. If you can educate in an entertaining way, you're going to much better engagement than if it's just straight textbook talk. You know, if you can entertain in a way that makes people think, think and remember, you know, think about something differently, again, you're going to come across as a thought leader. They're going to really enjoy and come back to you again, but you got to do at least one of those things. If you are putting out how-to content and it's telling people stuff they already know, they didn't learn anything. It wasn't fun. They don't feel anything. Yeah. Instantly forgettable. What do you say to the business owner, the small business owner, um, who is just nervous to go on camera or like terrified to get their, their own opinions and perspective out there? How do you get them started on this process? There is, there's often that element to kind of overcome, um, of finding your own voice Mm -hmm. and putting it out there. So the first thing I would say is accept that not everybody is going to like you and like what you have to say. Mm. And that's okay. Like you have to be okay with that. There's yeah. a great quote uh, by Dita Von Tees that I use all the time. And she said, you could be the sweetest, juiciest peach in all the world. And there's still going to be someone who hates peaches. Right? <laughs> it's it's not you. It's not you. Like yeah. you, if you walked into a room with 10,000 people, you would not expect to make best friends with every one of those 10,000 people. Some of them are not going to be for you and that's okay. So yeah. you have to kind of get past that fear of rejection. And that's part of having a business, right? Yes. Not everybody is going to buy from you. Not everybody who walks in the door is going to walk up to the register. You have to be okay with that because all the time that you waste chasing after someone who doesn't really want or need what you have it's time that you could be spending nurturing people who do want and need what you have. 
Right. So that's number one. Um, and then number two is find your voice and you can ease into it. Um, if you're, if we're talking social media, find your channel, you know, talk to your customers or ideal customers to figure out what channels they're on, go hang out there and don't post for a while, comment. Right. Um, and don't comment great post or liked this hearts. <laughs> um, actually when, if something was a great post, stop yourself and think, okay, why is that great? What do I really like about this? And comment mm -hmm. that. And if you see something that you that doesn't quite hit it for you, comment that politely, right? Hey, I disagree because this. And after a while, you'll start noticing patterns in yourself. These are the kinds of things that I like to talk about, particularly those disagreement ones. You'll start mm -hmm. finding like, gosh, everybody keeps saying this piece of advice and that's wrong. That's bad yeah. advice. Awesome. Now you know what you want to post about. Right. Here's the good advice. If you frame it in your head, not as I'm going to talk to customers and try to sell them. If you frame it as I have good information that can help them, it's so much easier to share good information that people should know. Mm hmm that takes a lot of practice, I think, though, like if if you are posting information or sharing information that is good information, but that goes against <laughs> something that feels or seems common, like you said earlier, you're going to have to get used to people barking back and, and nipping at your heels for lack of a better expression, just because it happens, it happens all the time and you, you're going to have to get a little bit thick skinned, but yeah. you know, if that's what it takes to build that brand awareness and, and engage the funnel, like that's what it takes. That's where I draw the line between content that is thought leadership and what's mm -hmm. not. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody says, I want to be a thought leader. Not everybody actually does because they don't actually understand what that means. So right. Thought leadership, by definition, you are leading people's thoughts. You are taking them in a different direction than they've been going. Mm -hmm. And that means you're going to get some resistance. If you really want to be a thought leader, you have to be okay with people actively disliking you. Yes. Like not just saying, I disagree, saying you're an idiot. Like you have to be okay with that kind of feedback. And if you're not, that's all right. You don't yes. have to be a thought leader. You yeah. can put out entertaining educational content that doesn't try to take them down a different path that just helps them refine the path they're on. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be controversial. You can be helpful in other ways. And that really does come down to like your comfort level. I openly admit I am not a thought leader. <laughs> I cannot handle controversy or I don't handle it well. Mm -hmm. And I, it's just something I know about myself. And I, I have learned that the hard way I, I used to make a million years ago, I used to make YouTube videos about skincare. Mm -hmm. And when people, I was probably in my early forties at the time. And when people told me how ancient I looked and how ugly I was, I was like, ah, you know, this isn't for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know that's not specifically thought leadership, but it just was an example of, you know, can, how thick is your skin? And it's just not for me. And I, I'm, I know that about myself. <laughs> so yeah. that's a, you know. And yet here you are, like you are still creating content. You are yes. still helping people. Yes. You're just helping yeah. people to figure out which path to be on, to refine mm -hmm. the path that they're on, to stick to it and not get distracted. Like there are lots of valid things. Not everybody can be a thought leader for God's sakes. Like there's only so yeah. many schools of thought that exist <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. In, in your niche. They might all be taken. You might not have any completely yeah. unique insight and that's okay. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you shouldn't create content. You still have a unique point of view. Yes. You, you don't have a unique take on everything you're still viewing the world through your lens that nobody else is and exactly. that comes across and that's still your superpower 
I love that you said that because that's at the end of the day, I think that's something that's so important and that we need to remind small business owners all the time. Like it's being yourself is what matters. How do you balance the quality versus quantity debate that surrounds social media marketing content? Oof. I mean, (laughs) that's a good reaction right there. We can stop. (laughs) Okay. Your most successful, your most financially successful creators are doing both. Yes, there's no question. There's no argument Mm -hmm. um, that they are blasting out good content. For a small team, and that's where I come in when I say sustainable content plans, because if you are a team of one or two or three people, you can't. Something's got to give. And too often, the thing that gives is the people. Um, So don't let that be you. Like, don't be (laughs) don't be the thing that gives because you've just burn out and break yourself. Yeah. So I think. Quality comes first because we are drowning in content. There's Uh so much out there. And now that the machines are involved, it is increasing at an exponential rate. Like no matter how much content you can crank out, you cannot crank it out faster than Uh ChatGPD. But you can crank it out better. So the more content there is out there, the more really good stuff stands out. Um, yeah. It, yeah, it's hard to to get eyeballs when they're, people are drowning in content. It's hard to get the attention, but it's a lot easier to keep that attention and to turn the attention into action when your content is good. And I think that's really where the quality versus quantity comes down. Do you want attention or do you want action? And probably you want action. Likely you want action. <laughs> Otherwise, you're... <laughs> Yeah, it's like, if you just want attention, I mean, I guess, okay, you do you, mm-hmm. uh, but probably you want people to do something after consuming your content. Right. Quantity can get you a lot of attention. Quality is better for getting you action. And that's where things like repurposing come in, right? Like mm-hmm. squeeze as much quantity out of a quality concept as we can. You elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Um So I want to start with sort of the myth of repurposing, which is that repurposing content is easy because it's not. (laughs) No. (laughs) It is easier. Easy is not the same as easier. Yes. Um, If you were going to repurpose your podcast, you still have to make all the other forms of content. Like you can't just throw links to your podcast out everywhere. That's not repurposing. That's link distribution. So you still have to make all these other things, but it is easier to repurpose a podcast than to start from scratch with every single channel you're going to put content out on. So that's the repurposing myth. It's not easy. It's just easier. There's, there is no zero effort way to make content. I'm sorry. Um, if there was, we'd be drowning even worse. Like you would have no need for people like me. (laughs) Um, And we need you. Oh my (laughs) word. The world needs Dana. (laughs) So when it comes to squeezing the greatest quantity out that you can, um, repurpose the concept over the content again don't just lift paragraphs out of your blog and throw them verbatim Mm -hmm. up on your social medias that's not going to work either take your blog post and each section is going to be about sort of a key concept what's the key takeaway and you can use some of the same phrases you can lift some direct sentences that Mm -hmm. are that really hit that key takeaway and turn those into LinkedIn posts. Throw them into Canva and put make them pretty and put them out as Instagram posts. Or film yourself talking about it for 30 seconds and make a YouTube short or a TikTok short. Uh, if you're repurposing your podcast, same thing. You're going to cut it into small videos that you can put out as social media posts. And you're going to focus on the key concepts, like each question that you're asking it could uh-huh. be its own little 10 second, 30 second, whatever video. Take those best pieces out of there and put them in written form for your social media. You are still putting effort in, but you're not starting from square one 
for YouTube and LinkedIn and Instagram, you're starting with a foundation. That's such great advice. I'm guessing that's all part and parcel of the things that you coach and consult people on when it comes to content marketing and marketing in general for their businesses. I create a content plan uh, for the quarter. And okay. often, I can't say always because it is, you know, depends on the customer and what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. Often you're going to have sort of a big piece, a big foundational piece that does take more effort and more work. Right. But then that big piece feeds content throughout the quarter. So you put in that heavy effort once, but then you can kind of dial back your effort for a while. Yeah. And let that feed out. That's great. That's, that's, that's smart marketing right there. All right, Dana, I have one more question for you. How do you leverage the power of storytelling and emotion in your social media content? So stories are what separate us from the machines, right? We have them. They can make them up based on what they draw from other sources of inspiration, but they don't really have stories. We do. Right. Storytelling is your key part of engagement. Humans are hardwired to remember stories. That's why we teach little children in story form, right? That's why we have stories with a moral, because yeah. that's what makes the lesson hit home. That's what makes the lesson stick, is a yeah. story. So storytelling should be incorporated wherever it can be. And it doesn't have to be so difficult or elaborate. Like it doesn't have to be the one day I was making breakfast and I had a thought about how waffles are like business and I thought I need to make a LinkedIn post about it. That's You don't have to have stories like that. But be real. Remember that you're talking to people. Mm -hmm. Because people are hardwired to remember stories. And so I think... I believe we're also hardwired to tell them. I think we're hardwired to share information in that way. So go back to the, probably the oldest piece of content creating advice there is. And when you're creating content, think of one person that you're talking to. Just, and don't, you're not talking to the whole internet. Right. You're talking to this one person and trying to share this piece of information with them probably you're going to put it in some level of a story form. It'll be a, well, you know how when you do this, or imagine you're doing that, or, hey, I saw this situation the other day that really applies to this concept. It just yeah. naturally comes out of us. Yeah, that's so true. I think we overthink it, honestly. Storytelling is so crucial, but I really think that we overthink it, particularly people who are not natural creatives right writing doesn't come naturally speaking doesn't come naturally um you know they're doing their best to create their content and god bless them and they're doing great but they're told okay you need storytelling I'm like well what is it? like do i need a plot do i need characters yeah like what does that even mean yeah. yeah you know what just imagine that you're explaining this to your best friend or to your favorite customer yeah how do you say it just don't let them know they're your favorite. No. <laughs> Keep it in your head. <laughs> well, they can know they're your favorite. Don't let anybody else know they're your favorite. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's like announcing your favorite child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Dana, thank you so much. You have just enlightened even me today with, with just nuggets of really, really great advice and information. Tell those watching and listening today where they can reach out to you, where they can find you. And uh, yeah, just thank you again so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. Well, thanks so much for having me, Laura. I've had so much fun. Uh, you can find me on Substack, danahera.substack.com. Uh, my name is D-A-N-A-H-E-R-R-A. So danahera.substack.com. You can subscribe and get my thoughts every week in your inbox. You can also find me on LinkedIn under my name. I'm really active there and always open to new connections. So looking forward to hearing from some people. And again, thanks so much for having me, Lori. This has been great. 